Greetings, unsettled souls, and welcome to the correct views. We gotta look at this. This is from uh, news.sky.com here at the massive Fukushima update. Welcome aboard. Hundreds of cubes of Nazi uranium are missing, and now scientists have a new way to spot them. It says, although the Nazi or nuclear weapons program had a head start on the U.S. effort, it faltered due to the regime's politicization of academia, which caused many researchers to flee the country or deflect to either the U.S. or Russia, which is exactly what America is doing to our wisest minds today due to the censorship of facts and the promotion of non-fact. Uh, the idea that those, who, those of us who are giving factual information regarding Fukushima or regarding vaccines, or those of us who are being honest are being told that we are not factual, and the application of fake science is being fact-checked and called real, which is creating the same situation that the Nazis had here. So looking back, it is important to learn this since we're repeating it. Again, you, you can repeat the mistakes of Nazi Germany without sending people to death camps. That wasn't the only mistake that they made. I think that's important to understand. When people compare someone to Nazi Germany, they're not saying that they want to kill someone like Nazis. Rather, they're saying that the similarities are here for a downfall in ways that may not have to do with ushering minorities to their death. That's not the only screw-up that the Nazis made. Hundreds of cubes of Nazi uranium produced as part of the German nuclear research program went missing after the Allied victory in Europe, but now scientists have developed a way to identify them when they show up. And this is good, because uh, terrorists and uh, people who would enjoy causing great amounts of chaos and possibly making entire regions and cities unlivable, at least in sections, you could do that by building a dirty bomb, which wouldn't need the mushroom cloud. It would just blow up and disperse deadly materials over an area and make them uninhabitable. Well, they'd probably lie and still have people living there, but the truth, the correct view, the, uh, the real science, not the science they would promote, but the real science that like you get here, it, it would say that you can't live there. So it's important that we figure this out. It's also important that we remember good science from bad science. <clears throat> the race to develop nuclear technology was a critical venture during the Second World War. Though nuclear rep weapons never entered into the conflict in Europe, and more than a ton of the radioactive metal was hidden in secret laboratories throughout Nazi Germany. Now, new techniques to identify these uranium cubes have been presented at a meeting of the American Chemical Society. <clears throat> it says that it could help investigators into the, legal traffic, the illegal trafficking of nuclear materials. Although the Nazi program, the Nazi nuclear weapons program, had a two-year head start on the U.S. effort, it never escaped the laboratory, in large part due to the regime's politicization of academia. We mentioned that at the beginning. During the early 1940s, there were several German scientists who were competing to exploit nuclear fission to contribute towards the war effort. These included Werner, Werner Heisenberg, a Nobel Prize winner who had been attacked by the regime as a white Jew for his work on theoretical physics, something opposed by the Aryan physics movement, which was based on Einstein's theory of relativity. Many of you know Einstein, for as brilliant as he was, was wrong on a number of things. It would appear one of them is a black hole, which he said didn't exist, and it seems that they do. Heisenberg was initially based in Berlin, but was moved to a secret laboratory beneath a medieval church in the town of Hegelok in the Swabian Alps to try to avoid the Allied troops. Another researcher, which was Kurt Diebner, it says, was based at a different experimental laboratory in Gatau, and the uranium cubes were produced at these sites to fuel nuclear reactors. Now, stay with me, because it gets into why it's important. The cubes, it says, measuring about two inches on each side, were hung on aircraft cables to make a kind of nuclear chandelier that was submerged in heavy water, water made with the hydrogen isotope deuterium. 
in the hope that the uranium decay would provoke a self-sustaining nuclear chain reaction. Ultimately, of course, that design failed. When the U.S. and British forces reached the Hagelok Laboratory in 1945, more than 600 of the uranium cubes were shipped to the U.S. after being dug up from a field near the town. Great, great storage there. Some of these um, may have been used in the American nuclear weapon efforts, while others today belong to collectors, including research institutions. But hundreds of the cubes from the Diebner Laboratory have disappeared. One cube is held in the Pacific Northwest, Northwest National Laboratory in the U.S., but nobody really knows where it, how it got there, according to Dr. John Schwantes, the principal investigatory behind, inve, I'm supposed to say investigator, nice typing, behind the new research. The team also worked with Dr. Timothy Kof at the University of Maryland, which also has access to a few other cubes. The PNLL cube is used to train international border guards and nuclear forensics researchers to detect nuclear material being trafficked. Although it's labeled a Heisenberg cube, doctoral student at the PNLL, Brittany Robertson, says that that assertion is anecdotal. Robertson turned to a technique called radiochronometry, <clears throat> the nuclear version of the technique used by geologists to identify the age of carbon samples based on the radioactive isotope content. That's how you can tell if uh, poison from Fukushima is actually from Fukushima or not. You can test it this way. As explained by the American Chemical Society, when the cubes were first cast, they contained fairly pure uranium metal. But as time has passed, radioactive decay transformed some of the uranium into thorium and pro protactin. Robertson has adapted a radiochronometry procedure to separate and quantify these elements in PNNL's cube, developing a method that shows how their relative concentrations reveal how long ago the cube was made. And it's kind of a long-winded explanation here, but basically you can tell by how far it's broken down how far it has changed from its pure form into the other two radioactive isotopes, which isn't particularly that novel, but it is a good way uh, to apply, I think, what we've already... Like, this is being presented as something new. It's really not. But it's being used to track various weapons-grade materials, which we need to know about. And I think also it's a, they sort of printed the obvious here, because like I said, this isn't new technology. But it does let terrorists or those who would be interested in acquiring or making weapons out of these sorts of materials to say, hey, we're keeping an eye on you. We know where you are. We know what we're doing, and we can't track this. So you guys can take it for what it's worth. But I thought it should be part of the massive Fukushima update. Let me know what you think in the comment line.